Welcome, Peter Christian. He's a founding partner and president of ESPI, a business consulting firm in Northeastern PA. Previously, he was an executive at Crayola Corporation. Uh, he's worked with 300 and more clients in business development, profit improvement, operations, IS selection and implementation, and project management. He has 40 plus years of experience in strategic and facility planning, CI, lean, and supply chain. Uh, he has helped companies to realize millions of dollars in cost reduction and profit improvements, adding and retaining thousands of jobs. He has authored the Amazon best-selling business books, What About the Vermin Problem, and Influences and Influencers. Peter, welcome. Great. Nice to be here. So uh, that's quite the resume. Sounds like you've been uh, very busy. And one of the things that you mentioned to me is you're, you're, you're sort of retired, but I guess retiring is a little bit harder than it appears. You're still active. What are you doing these days? Yes, I am. Well, uh, the two books that uh, you mentioned, uh, I wrote after I retired and got them out. It was something I wanted to do. Actually, I only wanted to do one, but somebody convinced me to do a second, so I did. Uh, but I've continued to write. I write a lot of articles that I publish. I usually publish two or three a month, uh, either through Medium or through my uh, website. Uh, I have gotten involved with some of my old schools, uh, Rutgers University. I'm on a couple of educational boards there uh, as an advisor on some of the curriculum and student projects. Uh, I teach uh, project management at Alvernia University up in Pennsylvania. And no, I do not travel up there to teach it. I do it via, just like we're doing here, Zoom. Uh, and I do a bit of consulting. I have a couple of opportunities facing me for the fall, so it looks like it's going to be a very busy fall with uh, uh, doing some project management training for a couple of organizations. Uh, and uh, then I have a good time. You know, I do nice things. I'll be going on a trip pretty soon out west for a week and uh, visiting some of the national parks and uh, doing some other interesting and fun things. So it's been pretty busy retirement. It sounds like it. It sounds like it. So just out of curiosity, I mean, what um, what's it take you, what type of company does it take to get you off the retirement bench and actually working with them on some project? Uh, one that is sincere about wanting to make improvements. They realize that there's something that's holding them back from where they want to be. Uh, usually it's not one that's like a uh, doorstep away from bankruptcy or closing their doors. And, you know, if I don't step in to save them, they're going to shudder. Uh, at that point, they're too far gone. And I, I don't like to get into that. Uh, and I haven't for the better part of my career. Um, but they they're still viable, but there's something holding them back and they need somebody to come in, take a, a different look at it, a fresh perspective, uh, tell them what's really going on and then help them to, uh, to achieve what they want to achieve. And that, that's a lot of satisfaction in that. Wow. You know, so one thing that you said, people who want to make a change. Yes. I've encountered you know, multiple groups that would fall under that umbrella. There are people that say they need to make a change and then you discover aren't ready. Uh, there are people that are right, you know, want to make a change and then they realize, you know, and they're very, very sincere and they realize what's involved in that. And they're like, well, I could never do that. Uh, and then there are people who are legitimately, hey, let's, let's do whatever. There's probably a couple other categories. What have you seen? Uh, all of the above. And uh, quite honestly, after a while, uh, when I would have the first interview with a company, I would say to them, now, are you really committed? And they kind of look at me and I'd say, well, you know, I've heard that before about, oh, we want to do. And then when they're faced with the reality that all of a sudden they get cold feet or they they really weren't committed to doing it. Uh, and you get a sense from people whether they're being honest with you, because, again, people, you know, tell you fibs all the time. Uh, and those are the ones I want to work with, okay? Uh, because they're going to put 
their time, you're going to put your time, they're going to put their money into it. And you want to be see them be successful. Uh, I take that stuff very personally. When I get involved with an organization and I'm working for them, uh, I actually am working with them and I consider myself part of the organization. So if they don't succeed, I didn't succeed either. And that hits me personally uh, because I want to see them and I want to see them get the value for the money and their time and, and so forth. So I really want to see that commitment up front. Uh, I've had some companies that didn't, you know, they they really didn't uh, want to do what they said they wanted to do when they were faced with the reality. And that's very, very frustrating. So uh, I try to, uh, to, to kind of call those folks out and, and just work with the ones that are really intent on, on making a change. So what, what about those that don't implement? It, it's, you know, their, their effort wasn't completely disingenuous because obviously they committed time and money to the effort, uh, but they didn't move forward. What, what do you think is going on? What's, what's hindering them from moving forward? Well, in some cases, it's looking in the mirror and finding out that they're the they're cause of their own problem. And that's very difficult, but particularly for a, a business owner, because, you know, that's their baby. They developed it. They did whatever. Uh, and for them to now to admit that they're a cause of their own problem and have to make changes themselves is a big deal. Uh, I have one quick story about a company worked with and um, they made uh, parts for jet engines. And we went through and came up with all sorts of improvement stuff and that, and they liked everything. And, and instead of us putting a value on it, we asked them to, and it was about a half a million dollars. And they were about a $7 million company. So a half a million dollars is pretty good for a $7 million company. So about a year goes by and I get a call from a fellow who had been involved with us. And he says, you know, they're very disappointed. And I said, well, what? He says, well, they've not realized one cent of improvement. So I said, hmm, that's interesting. I said, so, uh, you know, what changes did they make? He says, well, they didn't make any. And you just kind of go, excuse me? So they had this whole list of things to do. They said they could handle it. They didn't want us to get involved. And they didn't do one thing. And now they're disappointed that they didn't see an improvement. I said, why are we even having this conversation? That's crazy talk. I said, you've got to implement and, and you get into that, you know, a uh, company, they, they've got it all in front of them and then they don't do anything with it. Uh, that's why I like to have um, an engagement where not only do we come up with the improvements, but then we help them to institute them to make sure that they actually get it done. I've had some that said, oh, well, we'll pay you X dollars based off of what we implement. And I said, and what if you don't implement anything? And they just kind of. And I said, no, we're, uh, we're not going that route. You pay me for the ideas and then you implement and you get the benefit of everything. But no, we're not going on this. Well, I'll pay you based on what I implement. Because if you back off, I don't get paid. And I put a lot of time and effort into this. So uh, so it's, it's crazy stuff out there. Uh, why some of them just don't do it. Besides looking in the mirror and going, ooh, I'm the problem. I better correct things. Uh, I can't really tell you. I'm not a psychologist. You, you know, my my first job out of college was uh, at Ericsson when Ericsson made mobile phones mm -hmm. and they spent the big money to bring in the consultants to find out what was wrong with the organization. The consultants came back and said it was a management problem. So the consultants got fired and they brought in another group of consultants that concluded the employees didn't understand the mission of the company. So I guess... I guess they're the smarter consultants. It was the same conclusion, different wording. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so oh, gotta love it. When um and obviously, yeah, there there are people like Ericsson who, by the way, the end result is they don't make mobile phones anymore because they would not change. And the um, but there's there are some that maybe need a little bit of encouragement or just you can get them there. They're just having trouble getting there themselves. What, what are some tips that you found that will take somebody that's, you know, maybe they're, they're probably scared. They're probably terrified. How do you guide somebody through that? 
what you do is, again, it's usually not just one thing that's standing in the way. There's a list of things. And again, you can prioritize them because there are some that have a big impact and some that don't have much impact at all. So what you try to do is do something simple to start with, something that they can do fairly quickly. It's not going to be earth shaking. It's not going to change the direction of the company, but they get a success out of it. And when they see that, and the people that are involved to go, wow, that's really cool. Let's do the next one. When they're asking you, let's do the next one, or, you know, people who weren't involved say, hey, can I get involved too to, to do it? Because I really like what you, you guys just did. Um, then you can move on to the next. But if you try to do the big one first and they haven't done anything before and they're having a hard time and it, it's taking a long time, even though the, there, there's a big reward out there, uh, sometimes that can, can get in the way and they go, if it's going to be like this, oh man, I don't think I, I'm signed up for that. But if you start small and you build on it, you do the next one and then the next one and they realize that it's a continuing process, you know, and the, that old saying, Rome wasn't built in a day, well, businesses weren't turned around in a day either. You know, they didn't get in trouble in a day, they're not going to get fixed in a day. But if you, you just keep working at it, uh, I think it gives them the confidence and, and then they realize what it's all about and, and they move on. So I've seen that as a, as a big thing, okay? Uh, and similarly, where you try to do too much at one time uh, or pick one that doesn't have an impact and has a lot of time involved and they go, I spent all that time and I got so little benefit, why would I want to do the rest of it? Those are detriments that, that get in the way of them uh, moving ahead. And, and, you know, I, th I think you highlighted something so critical that I really want to step back and just emphasize them thinking about, especially the, the young folks who may be listening to this, because, you know, one of the characteristics of young folks is they're full of piss and vinegar. They're ready to change the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is, is good, you know. But what you said, do something small first and then move on to the big thing. I think that is such incredible advice. I'll admit, I've been slow in my life learning that and um, wish I could have figured that out sooner, wish, wish I didn't repeat that mistake occasionally these days. That is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that because that's, um, I mean, that can make a difference in a lot of people's careers. Yep. To, to say success breeds success is definitely true. Uh, you get confidence, you get experience, okay? You find out what to do and what not to do. Things like I teach in my project management course. You know, you, uh, you do a post-mortem on every project you do uh, because even when it's successful, there are things that you did that you could have done a little bit differently that may not have been as painful or taken as much time. Uh, and so you correct those and, and the things that did do well, you kind of repeat those. So you're, you're always kind of reviewing what you did and trying to make improvements on it. Uh, that's why when you had mentioned about the things I did, CI was one continuous improvement. Uh, I did that before it was called continuous improvement. We just did it because that as an organization was what we uh, determined we were going to do. We were always looking at ways to do things better. Now it's become a big fashionable thing and you now there's a gazillion seminars on it and companies that'll help you in that. But we did it before it was that and we were very successful at it. And you mentioned I was at Crayola three years in a row. We didn't take a price increase because we kept our costs down and we didn't have to take it. Now, can you imagine a company doing that? Can you imagine not getting price increases year after year on different things? But yet we did it because we were very tuned in on that and uh, and worked it. So it, it's doable. Yeah, I've been absolutely. there. I can I can vouch for it. Absolutely. Well, and I just think about how much better our lives would be if if we looked at every area of our life and said um, and, and applied continuous improvement in principles. Absolutely. It applies in, in real life as it does in business. Yeah. So you obviously, again, you've retired, but you know, you, you're still out there and you're, you're working with companies. Yes. But 
the one of the things that we like to explore here on the Leaders and Legacies podcast is how you're making an impact beyond yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and feel free to go back into when when you were still in business, um, and the um, and, and in what you're doing now. How have you seen actions that you've taken that when you look back on them, you realized you made a bigger impact than you thought you were making at the time? Um, yeah, in a lot of cases, you, you don't, you, you kind of take stuff for granted or you kind of lose track of it. Uh, but as I, I go back, and that's why I started to write the books, because I started to think about my, my life experiences. Uh, what you do is, first of all, you, you include other people. You can only accomplish so much on your own. But when you have a group of people who you work well with, a team, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, uh, and they each have different skills that they bring to the table uh, and, and aptitudes, uh, that's important because no matter how smart and how good you are, you, you're limited in what you can do. I mean, look at the largest organization and the person who, who heads it, you know, Jamie Dimon running Chase or uh, Bezos running Amazon. They're not doing everything in the company every day. There's lots and lots and lots of people doing that and they have trust in them to do it and their organizations continue to grow and thrive and and be uh, kind of the highlights of, of what it takes to be an industry. Uh, so if those folks can't do it all, you certainly can't either. So it's, it's trusting other people, including them, listening to them, getting different opinions. Again, uh, things that I thought were right uh, 10 or 15 years ago have changed with the times. Uh, technology changes, ways to do things, or there's better ways to go about things. And you need to do that. If you're always going to say, well, this is the way it is, and this is the way it'll always be, you're making a big mistake because life will move on, okay, with you or without you. And better that it's with you than without you, because look at the companies that don't exist anymore, who didn't move on and didn't make the changes that were necessary. And they were some of the biggest companies in the country, if not the world, and they don't exist anymore. So that can happen to you and that can happen to your organization as well. So I I think it's really staying up with the times, getting involved with people, learning what the new trends are. You don't have to do all of them. Pick the ones that make the most sense and and work at it. and, And you should do very, very well. So for young people coming on board, as much as you learned, you'll learn a heck of a lot more when you get into the throes of things and realize you got to be flexible uh, and you've got to be good and you've got to trust other people and work with them and you should do very, very well. So if you could give a piece of advice to somebody who's leading others that has direct reports and Mm -hmm. you could only give one piece of advice, what would that one piece of advice be? Make sure they know what the end goal is and then turn them loose and let them work on it. Wow. And that's what I teach in my project management course. You know, if if people don't understand what the end goal is and and where they're headed, then how are they going to do the right things? All right. Uh, And once they do understand that, then let them do what they need to do. Now, you're there to manage them. Okay, and and people will make mistakes and you're going to get the person every now and again that's going to you know, slack off a little bit. You're there to keep them in line, but you you start with that because it, there's that old saying, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Well, that's really true in business. That's true in life too. So know where you're going and then pick the path and, and then work at it. And realize the path's going to be bumpy. It's not going to be beautifully paved and everything's going to be smooth and you're going to take detours in that. But if you're ready for it, then, then you'll do fine. And again, trusting other people. It's not just about you. It's about the people who work with you and for you that make the difference. So tell me about a white knuckled moment where you felt like your leadership was put to the test. You weren't sure how it was going to work out. And you thought, this is the right thing. I'm going to do it. What was that and how did it work out? 
Okay, 2008, 2009, if we all remember that, because we've had some financial crises since then, but that was when we had the great mortgage crisis in the US and borrowing dried up. Uh, and when borrowing dried up, guess what? A lot of companies decide that they're gonna work within and they're not gonna do a lot of external stuff, particularly with this group called consultants. So we felt an immediate impact on our business and the consulting industry with that. Now, when I got involved starting a company and running a company, ESPI, my pledge was that the people that worked for me were my responsibility. And that as long as they did their job, that I was responsible for them, their livelihood, not only for themselves, but for their families. So we had a tough decision to make because our, our business dropped precipitously. And the decision was we were not going to let anybody go. We were not going to cut staff because of that. So what we did is we looked at every possible expenditure that we had and how we could save money and, and so forth. And then at the end, our largest expenditure was always our salaries. We did is we went to the to the individuals and said, everybody is going to take a 20% pay cut. The owners, the employees, everybody. And they did. So we did not lay one person off. Now, things were still tough and they were still tight, but everybody was still employed. They were still working. They were still getting paid. Okay. But it was like white knuckle time and we had a line of credit. And we were getting pretty close to the max on the line of credit. You know what happens when that occurs. Then the banks want you to, to pay back the money that, uh, that you've uh, uh, borrowed from them. So we we're getting awful, awful close. But then things started to turn around. And they did. And they came back with a vengeance. And we got all the business back and then some. Well, then what we did is, after that was done, we had kept track of all the money that people did not get paid. And we went through each employee and paid them back whatever they had forsaken over that time frame. So they got back their 20%, okay? And they were whole, it just took a little bit of time. But it was white knuckle time because you didn't know how it was gonna work out. I mean, the easy thing, and you see that with companies all the time, things get tough. They, they lay off a hundred people, a thousand people, 10,000, whatever the case may be. That's the easy way to do it. In fact, you and I were talking a little bit about Lee Iapoca before. Uh, I remember when I was at Crayola and the VP said to me at one time, he said, I want you to reduce costs. He says, and be like Lee Iapoca. Lee Iapoca says that he can reduce uh, costs by 10% at any time. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I picked up one of Iapoca's books and I found the page where he said it. And he said, I can reduce costs by 10% at any time, but what are the ramifications of doing that? And he left that part out. And I always yeah. thought about that, you know, when you go to slice costs, what are the ramifications of slicing that cost? And if it means losing bodies, well, what happens after you've lost bodies and now things start to turn around, you don't have the people to do the work. Hmm. Yep. And you've lost all that talent, okay? And also people realize that they're a commodity that you, you say you care about them, but when things get tough, you don't quite care as much. Well, that's when you really care about people. That's when you show your true grit. So, uh, so that was a tough time. That was a light, white knuckle time. I had a lot of sleepless nights until we got through that, but we did. And people were very grateful for that. And they were very grateful that they got their money back, Okay. Uh, and I think that was a true test of my leadership to be able to get through that and not to show everybody how inside I was churning up and, you know, oh, I hope we make it through another day type of thing. So it was a tough time, but we made it. And, and that is a wonderful story of leadership. And it's, you know, the thing that strikes me is, you know, it's a competitive environment. And I think it's a val your story is valuable for where folks are in 2023 you know, with the economy where it is. But if you're looking for a way to differentiate yourself, be the company that's uh, that's committed to your employees and shares the burden with your employees. So few are doing it, it's easy to stand out. Yes. 
That's not an easy thing to do. I mean, the easy thing is you just slice. You slice all over the place, okay? Chop, 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 chop. And that's why when I work with companies uh, and one of my prized things uh, you had mentioned about uh, increasing the employment of companies, I have never been an advocate for chopping heads, okay? And I never suggest that to any company that I work with. All right. If you've got an employee that's not good and you're holding on to them, well, that's a different case. But if they're doing their job and they're doing it well, then they should basically have a guaranteed employment unless they decide that they want to go somewhere else. OK. Um, and you have an obligation to them. And you find other ways to uh, uh, to, to find cost savings at Crayola when we made reductions and we did do reductions in different areas. We found ways to do things with less people. Maybe instead of having 10 on a production line, we got it down to eight or something. Uh, with the two people that we took off, they didn't get fired. We found something for them to do. Now I always had an argument with finance. Well, did you really save anything because they're still around? But guess what? The company was growing. So when it grew, there were new opportunities and those two people that got bumped off of the line they were put onto something different. So they always had, you know, some kind of job security. So then they would help to look at improvements and, and they would, you know, kind of to take part in that. And, and I wouldn't say excited, but they, they always participated as opposed to, well, I'm not gonna tell you anything because I don't wanna lose my job. Uh, so that's a whole different attitude when you do something like that and people realize that you really do care about them and you value them and, and you're not just gonna, they're not commodities and you're not just gonna chop them when it, it's convenient for you to do that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's inspiring. So um, we're gonna start wrapping up, but before we do, let's, let's talk about, you've got two books out. What about the vermin problem and influence and influencers? So yes. what are those books about? How do people find them? Okay. Uh, well, the first one, What About the Vermin Problem, is a collection of uh, stories, okay, experiences that I had. I picked 12 uh, of different companies, uh, and uh, I wrote about them uh, because as I was going through my experiences with them, I would say to somebody, you know, that would make a good story in a book someday. And they go, absolutely. Well, that someday came and I wrote it. Uh, and some were very good experiences. Like we talked about where companies took uh, whatever we gave them and, and made the changes and were very successful and some that didn't and they continued to struggle and some that got really bad because they did things exactly the opposite or what they were continuing to do and, and failed miserably. Uh, so it, it's kind of a compilation of those into different categories that I call the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, and it's kind of life lessons to say, you know, there's a fine line between being very successful and failing. And it all depends on the decisions you make and the actions that you take. Uh, so think about it, just like with the 10% cut before you do it, because there are ramifications for everything and, and pick the right path. OK, and, and go with that. So that's what that one is about. The second one influences and influencers. It's about, well, how do we get to the point where we make decisions? What influences us in order to take the actions that we normally take, to make the decisions that we normally make, uh, to think the way that we think? And it, it's a lifetime of experiences. It starts when we're very young, of course, with our parents, you know, who are teaching us, uh, you know, how to do things and, and what not to do and so forth. But there's a host of people in our lives, whether they're teachers or coworkers or bosses or, or um, you know, alliances, other companies that we deal with, uh, where they help us, they teach us, they uh, work with us, they work for us, and we learn from them. We should be learning from them. Uh, and when they help us, and sometimes it's knowingly and sometimes it's not knowingly, and I had a number of folks like that. I had a professor in school who got me scholarships I never knew about. All of a sudden they showed up. I had no idea that they were there. He was helping me because he was interested and invested in me. Uh, and we need to recognize those people and thank them for what, what they do for us. 
Okay. And similarly, there are some people who influence us who do not have our best interests at heart. And we need to take them into account too, because we can still learn from them. You know, you want to say, I want to be like that fellow as a, and similarly, I don't want to be like that person. I don't want to be that kind of person and, and treat people the way they treat people or do what they do or say what they say or whatever the case may be. Uh, so again, they've got an impact. I did it from business, but also from life experiences. So they, they've got a, a play into both uh, outside of the business world and what we do on an everyday basis and also what we do in, in our business. Uh, because uh, again, we make choices on everything that we do and the better choices we make, the, the better the outcomes. Uh, where you can get them, uh, any of the big uh, distributors that sell books, uh, whether it's Barnes and Noble or that little guy, Amazon, that we mentioned before, uh, certainly on there. But if you've got other favorites, I think they're on 10 or 12 different um, places that you can get books. Uh, just look it up on, on the names. What about the vermin problem or influences and influencers? Or usually they've got them together. They say buy the two of them as a set and that. Uh, and I think they're a great read. I get terrific feedback with people who go, you know, I know somebody just like that, or I went through something just like that. Boy, I wish I had had this book 10 years ago. Well, it's not 10 years old, so, but use it now. So. Oh, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. And thanks for letting um, me. Yeah. And th now if somebody wants to um, tap into some of your scarce time and pull you out of retirement, how did they reach you? Okay. Uh, well, you can find me on LinkedIn, Peter Christian, and look, uh, it's a fairly common name. Uh, but anyway, you can find me, uh, look at this beautiful face and then remember it. Uh, but it, it's listed as author and consultant and, and, and so forth. So you can pick me out from the others. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I have a website, uh, as you mentioned, uh, PHC. Uh, is my company. So it's uh, PeteChristianBooks.com. So you can do that and you can send me a little note and say, I would love to talk. Let's, you know, converse. However, we can do that. And the third way is through my email address, which is my initials P H and then my last name, Christian 53 at gmail.com. So any one of those three, send me a note, say, you know, I heard you talk and I've got some things that I would like to talk about. Can we get together and do a Zoom call or a phone call or, you know, email or whatever the case may be. And here's what I'd like to talk about. And I would be happy to do that and see where it goes. Well, Peter, thank you for being on Leaders and Legacies this morning. It's been a wonderful conversation. Likewise. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.